아저씨 판다고 해놨는데? 오늘 안 해? 여기가 제일 중심가네. 여기 만져있어도 재밌겠다. It's about 12 feet away from the bank. He throws Togo up in the bench, up on the on the bank. It commands he Togo he the command to pull, and Togo just digs in and pulls. And he's able to get him to a point where he can get the sled and the serum off the ice slope, back on the land. They continue on their journey. There. Now, we've always thought Togo deserves a little bit of credit for that effort. Yeah. He was 12 years of age at that time, pretty old for a sled dog. So they retired him after his service there in that moment. But in retirement, he was able to father 260 puppies. <laughs> Most every uh, team that in the Diderot that runs has a, a descendant of Togo in their bloodlines. Companies are trying to build the Alaska Railroad in bankrupt. So finally, in 1914, the federal government stepped up and said they would not only fund, but they would uh, actually build the Alaska Railroad. They came to Alaska and did it. Sent 2,000 men. Those men lived in 1,000 insulated army tents in this area down here and built the Alaska Railroad. This is where the original town site of Anchorage was, is down here next to the railroad. The little engine to your left is little Alaska engine number one. It was used in the building of the Alaska Railroad, but before coming here, it was actually used in the building of the Panama Canal. Now notice the bumper on the front of that train, it's called the Moose Cruiser. That little uh, engine would go ahead of the coal train and bump into the moose that were on the tracks, off the tracks, so that the train wouldn't get derailed. So it served a very valuable purpose. Finished that line in 1916. Uh, decided in uh, 1923 to build a line into the interior of Alaska, which they did. Now at the time, Warren G. Harding is president of the United States. And he decides that since he's president, he should be able to come to uh, Anchorage and he should be able to drive in the last spike join these two lines together. So he writes to the people and says, yeah, what's the weather like? Well, oh, sir, it can be quite uh, chilly. We suggest that you wear your woolen underwear, hats, coats, gloves, and mittens. Dress warm when you come to Alaska. And it can be chilly in Anchorage, Alaska. But he's going to the interior Alaska, to Fairbanks, Alaska. And on the day he's to drive in the spike, it's 95 degrees in Fairbanks, Alaska. Well, he swings up and it's not quite it's six times, but no, 12 times before he finally hits the spike. And they'll report in their, in their newspapers that he was suffering from heat prostration. That's why he had a hard time hitting the spike. But those of us here in Alaska will tell you that no, actually he was suffering from intoxication. He had too many beers on the train ride up to Alaska trying to cool off in that hot weather. As you go to the old YouTube videos of that moment, you watch him swing and he stumbles around. He swings and he stumbles around. And finally the guy in the voiceover comes on and says, President Harding taking correct to swing before swimming in the plane. On the right side of the trolley is the Cook Inlet, named after the famed British explorer, Captain James Cook. James Cook came to uh, Alaska in, in beginning in the year of uh, 19, uh, 1776. That would be amazing if he did that then. Later, there's some nice monuments, some good, good visual pictures off the edge there. So King George was interested in finding a great Northwest Passage, a body of water that went through North America to speed up trade between the Atlantic to the Pacific side. Um, so Cook takes off, he gets around the west coast of North America, runs into a group of Indians called the Chumash Indians. The Chumash Indians tell him, yeah, if you keep sailing north, you're going to find that great body of water. But what he finds is the Columbia River, and he knows that it's just simply not big enough. So he continues to sail up. He gets into these waters here, now he thinks he's in a river. He's very excited about that. Well, how does he know that? Well, they used to take a bucket of water, throw it, throw it over the side of the ship, uh, take a bucket, throw it over the side of the ship fill of water, bring it back up and taste the water. If the water tasted salty, then they must be in an ocean still. But if it tasted fresh, then they must be in fresh water. And he thought he was. So Cook sails up, he gets uh, up to the head of the waters and realizes he can sail no farther than that point. The river comes to an end. And so he turns around, comes back, and anchoring off near where his statue is located today, writes in his journal, I fear once again that I must turn again my ship into the open ocean in search of the great Northwest Passage that I see. 
So the body of water that we saw in front of us is called the Cook Inlet, but where he came in is called the Turnigan Arm because Cook had to turn again his ship into the open ocean. Now in 1917, the city of Anchorage ended right there at now. The leaves come off the tree and they fall to the forest floor. There they're compacted over the course of five to seven years by ice and snow. Uh, and then they, they dry out and become a product called duff. Duff is a highly first things that grow back in a burned out forest in Alaska are both the willow tree and fireweed. <coughs> willow tree are important to the life cycle of the moose. A uh, life cycle will eat to 25 pounds of willow leaves a day in the summertime and 25 pounds of willow leaves a day, uh, willow bark, I'm sorry, in the wintertime. Their body actually goes through a change where they're able to gnaw off the bark of the tree and turn it into nutrition. So, kind of an unusual experience. Now, in 1964, there were two high schools in Anchorage, Alaska. West Anchorage High School on the west side of town, and East Anchorage High School on the east side of town. Now, I'm a proud graduate of West Anchorage High School, class of 1971, and the, the building you see to your left, of course, is West Anchorage High School. And the mural you see was able to grow many typical things you might grow in some of your gardens, lettuce and broccoli, kale, cauliflower, zucchini, beets, radishes, things like that. <clears throat> we also have uh, a lot of wild fruits, uh, with raspberries, blueberries, salmon berries, uh, uh, melon berries, high and low bush cranberries. We're also able to grow certain varieties of hardened crab apples. So as we turn to the left here on the right hand side, you'll see a, a crab apple forest we're trying to develop here. Now the reason they're wrapped in wire is because moose <clears throat> not only love crab apples, they love crab apple trees. And if you don't wrap those trees in wire, they will eat them all the way to the ground. Also, if you don't pick all the crab apples off of the tree in the fall of the year when they come on, so to speak, uh, they'll ferment on the tree. And moose are also very, very fond of fermented crab apples. Now, we had a moose that loved them so much, and he became famous for it. His name was Buzzwinkle the Alcoholic Moose. A buzzwinkle would wander from uh, crab apple tree to crab apple tree eating the fermented crab apples and he would uh, enjoy himself as doing that. Now, uh, of course, he would eventually die. And so the idea was they were going to donate his flesh to the local zoo. However, zoo officials refused or rejected the idea saying they were not going to feed alcohol infused meat to the polar bear. That was just something we were going to do that. But his remains were given to the fishing game where he was used to trap, tag, and track. Wolverine throughout Alaska. Now in Alaska there are four the framework of a whale, burying it in the ground, tying the framework together, then mounding dirt over the top of it, then digging a tunnel back in to gain entrance of it. Now in 1885, Mr. and Mrs. Isaacson thought that'd be a fun idea. So they built their house into this hill here over to our right. This is a modern day Barabara. They raised the five kids in this underground home. The, uh, there's 14 steps to the front door. The glass goes all the way natural daylight that goes into the home at the rear of the house. Uh, it says that it only costs about $80 a month to heat it, which I think is remarkable. On the deepest, darkest part of winter, which is just amazing. But you got to mow your roof on occasion. That's the downside. Now, what's the cost of living in Alaska? Well, the cost of living in Alaska is about 25% greater than that of the continental U.S. Uh, even though we're such a large state, we only have about 33,000 miles of improved roads here in Alaska. Uh, by way of contrast, in Seattle, Washington, downtown Seattle, you guys have over a million miles of paved road down in downtown Seattle. So quite a, quite a contrast between the two. Now, uh, our oldest son works in rural Alaska. All, we, uh, rur rural Alaska, we also call it Bush, Alaska. He just finished a village, uh, working in a village uh, of Tuntatuliak, and he found it necessary to buy a gallon of milk. He paid uh, $13 for a gallon of milk. He had to pay $7 for a loaf of bread, and a, can, a single can of soda pop was actually only $3. It costs a lot to get goods into Bush, Alaska. That's because it has to be either flo